Okay, so very briefly, what machine learning deals with. And here I'm talking about supervised learning. Okay, so we are given a domain, let's call it omega, for simplicity, assume that it's a unit d-dimensional cube. We have functions that live on this cube that belong to some class, let's say square integrable functions. Okay, and we have a functional that we denote by y, it takes a function on this domain and maps it to some space y. Okay. So just to make it sound less abstract, think of image analysis. So d is 2, in this case omega is a unit squared, f, the functions on this omega will be images, and basically the functional takes an image and produces something. Okay? So this something could be different things. For example, this space y could be discrete space, and its cardinality equal to the number of labels. So basically you produce a number between y and let's say 1000, and this is the label of the, of, the, of the object, of the class of the object. If you want multiple object recognition, this will be some representation of the probability of the object to belong to one of the classes. If it's a regression problem, then it will be some vector space, for example, n-dimensional Euclidean space. And in supervised learning, you are given a set of functions, basically a collection of images, let's say the image net, page mark, and you get the outputs of this functional, the labels. Okay? This is called the training set, and you want to recover the functional y given for this, uh, this training set. Okay? So usually it is approximated using some parametric function that they denote by u, <coughs> parameters theta, and we find the optimal parameters theta by minim minimizing some cost l that is tailored for our task, depending on what we are doing, whether we are doing regression or classification, on this training set. So basically I feed u with examples of my data with f i's, I compare the outputs to y i's, and I want this difference to be as small as possible. Okay. And basically I'm finding the optimal set of parameters that minimizes these costs. And basically, well, without going into the technical details, we can claim and actually prove rigorously that if the model is sufficiently complex in some sense, and the training set is sufficiently representative, you expect <laughs> to be able to find such data that basically y Applied to f, that's your ground truth label, is close to what the, your system u predicts with this set of parameters. Okay, so maybe there are many difficult problems hidden here. Usually these are non convex optimization problems, so how to find actually in, uh, using the computational data, how to find this set of parameters is a difficult problem. How to sample the, the, the training set is also a difficult problem, and so on and so forth. Okay, so I will end up with this. So what are neural networks? Basically it's a very simple system. So this is a single layer neural network. Assume that you have p-dimensional input. So these are some inputs, p-dimensional vector. Basically you do some linear combinations of p-dimensional inputs and you produce q-dimensional output. Okay? So basically you can represent it as matrix vector multiplication. Usually you also have the bias term, so here for simplicity you can assume that one of these inputs is just a constant. Okay? So basically here add also a bias term. And then you apply some nonlinear function that is called the activation. So there are several activations that are used in the literature. The most popular one, at least in computer vision applications, what is called the rectified linear unit. So basically it's a linear function from zero to infinity and zero or for the negative inputs. Okay? So and you can basically uh, the power of neural networks that you can combine several layers of this form, basically append them, uh, apply another layer on the output of the first layer, apply another layer on the output of the second layer, and so on and so forth. Okay, so basically you get uh, a hierarchical structure, and you can think of it basically after you learn, you get a piecewise linear approximation of your function. So basically the relos can be considered as a piecewise linear, uh, some piecewise linear function. Okay. So in this way you can approximate uh, anything sufficiently complex if your network is sufficiently deep. Okay. Now, the network is called deep if it has many layers, so it's some kind of a vague uh, notion what is deep, whether three layers are deep. People use several hundreds of layers in, nowadays, so these are probably very deep neural networks. Uh, maybe a few years ago, uh, the network is just five layers, which is considered deep, but it's not what we find. Okay, and basically if you have sufficient depth and sufficient number of parameters, you can approximate 
and some technical assumptions, any sufficiently good function. Okay, the phenomenon of overfitting, if you have too many parameters, too few training examples, basically, you will uh, learn a function that uh, fits well to the data but doesn't generalize to previous NC data. So this is overfitting. The training is usually done using backpropagation, which is just a chain rule, using stochastic optimization algorithms, basically. So, as you remember, the cost function consists of a sum of cost functions applied to, uh, uh, to training samples. So usually you approximate it stochastically by uh, sampling a random subset of the training set to reduce the computational complexity. And in general, deep nets are quite hard to train. So there are many remedies, architectural remedies, for example, LSTM, long short term memory models that are used in recurrent networks, especially used in speech recognition or text analysis. Maybe they solve the problem of vanishing gradients. The activation relo is uh, easy to differentiate. Basically, it's a linear function. Okay, it's maybe non smooth at some points, but basically, it, at most points, it behaves like a linear function. The optimization algorithm there are many and very efficient stochastic optimization methods that are currently used. And different ways of regularization, like weight decay, dropout, patient normalization, etc., that turn to, to be extremely efficient in, in training of very deep neural networks. Okay, let's talk actually about the motivation for convolutional neural networks. Basically, something called the traditional approach to deriving uh, convolutional neural networks is hand waving, saying that this is how we think that the brain works, dating back to, to the historical papers of Google and Bezos discovered that basically the, the, the cells of the human visual cortex are sensitive to different scales and different orientations. Basically, they act as local filters. So, basically, the first works in convolutional neural networks were actually inspired by this kind of brain architecture. But there are more recent works, in particular, the, the work, PhD work of Joan Moore and Stefan Marat, who tried basically to build this kind of or similar architectures from, uh, from first principles. Basically, the idea is the following. Assume that you have a translation operator, so, you know, by TV, that acts, acts on your function. We have our domain omega, it's a vector space. We can translate the functions of this thing. Okay. And now basically you, there are usually two assumptions on the function of y, right? That's the basically that's the label function that we can make. So first assumption is invariance. If I translate my function, I want the output of y to be the same as if I apply it to the original function. Okay. So basically this is translation invariance. Another assumption. So this assumption is typical in object classification tasks. Okay. I will show you an example. Another assumption is covariance. So in this case, you assume that the output of the functional is some vector space, so it's a regression problem. And basically, if you apply, basically the, the functional y commutes with the translation operator. So if you apply y to the translated version of f, you get y of f translated. And it's typically an object detection, localization, semantic segmentation, and motion estimation tasks. Okay. So this is an example. What is object recognition? I am looking at this picture, I want to say that these are bikers. Okay. So basically, why I need invariance? No matter where I see a bike or a person in the picture, I want still to produce the same value. Right? So this is invariance. Here it's semantic segmentation. So basically, I'm labeling each pixel. So if I see a person translated to different Position, I want the same pixels to be labeled in the same way, just translated. Okay, so basically the labels will be translated to a different position. So this is covariance. Okay. But this can also be generalized to uh, some nonlinear operations. So in general, we can talk about a smooth deformation field, tau, that basically somehow shuffles the pixels of your image. So basically, it's a deformation field of the domain omega. And we have the deformation operator. L of tau that is applied to our function, basically it deforms its coordinates. And this is a simple but good model for local translations, rotations. So rotation can be locally represented in this way, viewpoint change, perspective transformations, and so on and so forth. So the invariance in this case can be interpreted like this. So if I apply y to the 
form the version of f and I compare it to y applied to the original f, I will usually not get the same thing, but I want it to be bounded. And I want basically this difference to be somehow related to the norm of the gradient of this of this field tau, which is a, a kind of smoothness criterion of the deformation. Okay. And basically the prediction you can think that the prediction or the label will not change much if the input is slightly deformed. Why this is important? You can think of the famous uh, NIST digits, right? So basically, if we take digit 2, right, these are handwritten digits. Everybody will write them slightly differently than the same person, right? Writing the same digit several times will produce different results. So if I deform slightly the input, I don't want my classification to change. So the equivalent property of covariance, again here assume that it's a regression property. So I want the difference between y applied to the deformed version of f compared to the uh, y applied to f and then deformed again to be proportional to the norm of the gradient of tau. Yes. What is the sense of L applied to y? They don't necessarily have the same dimension. Well, so here you assume that it has the same dimension. So it's, it's a motion field. Okay. Here the assumption that it's, it, it lives in the same domain. So for example, it will be some pixel labeling. You know, Ocean field or something. So then it's a norm, right? It's a norm. Yeah, of course. Of course. <coughs> so again, I'm not being very formal here. You, can, you, you should use correct criterion of comparing these two things. Right? And this is actually, well, uh, as you are saying, this is a much stronger property because the space of deformation has a very high dimension. So basically, this is, this, in this case, the covariance property is much stronger. So, <coughs> Okay, and basically convolutional neural networks appear to satisfy these properties. Basically, convolutional neural network looks very much like the previous architecture. So the input is our functions, in our case, for example, images. We have P input functions. You can think of an RGB image. So we have three functions that are inputted to the network, right? The RGB and B channels of the image. The weights here are convolutions. So basically these are coefficients of convolutional filters and basically we produce new images, Q new images, G, that are convolved with these filters and summed up. And then we apply the nonlinearity. Okay. And you can apply many filters in this way. Okay. So this is a simple convolutional neural network architecture. What you can also do is to apply pooling. So basically, again, these are images. So basically, the convolution will not change. The convolution will not change the dimension of the image, right? It will just produce the filter image. So pooling does some kind of downsampling. So pooling in general will have this form. Okay. You take a pixel, you take neighbors around the pixel, and you apply some, for example, p norm to them. So it can be averaging, or usually what people use is max pooling. So basically, you take the LFE p norm. So this is how it works. This is your input image. You convolve it with the filter. This is what you get the output of a single conversion, what is also called in this literature feature map. And then basically you take a block of 280 pixels, just as an example, and you apply the maximum operation here. Okay. And this is your output. So you downsample your image twice in each dimension. Okay. And basically this way you create hierarchical features. You reduce the number of dimensions until you get a very small image, and then you can apply on this tiny image, you can apply a standard neural network on all the pixels, fully corrected them. Okay, so we've seen this picture.